Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's live broadcast, Using Networks to Understand the Genotype-Phenotype Connection, presented by our fabulous keynote presenter, Dr. John Krakenbush, Professor of Computational Biology and Bioinformatics at Harvard University and the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. I'm Susie Valdez, and I will be your moderator for today's educational webinar presented by LabRoots, the leading scientific social networking website and provider of virtual events and webinars advancing scientific collaboration and learning. Before we begin, I'd like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. Just click on the green Q&A button located at the lower left of the presentation window and type your questions into the box that appear on the screen. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. Also, please notice that you will be viewing the presentation in the slide window. To enlarge the window, just click on the screen icon located on the lower right. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, please click on the support button at the top right of the presentation window, or use the Q&A button to let us know that you're having a problem. Please join me now in welcoming our keynote, Dr. Quackenbush. I will now turn the presentation over to him. Welcome, sir. Well, thank you for the kind introduction. Uh, I hope you didn't raise expectations too high. But uh, it's my pleasure to be here today at this virtual conference. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to share with you uh, some of the work I and my colleagues have been doing around using networks to really explore the genotype-phenotype uh, connection. And um, I decided really to focus on one area in particular. Um, but I'm going to start by giving you a broader picture of, of how we think about building models and what we do when we create models. So I like quotes, and one of my favorite quotes is a quote you've probably seen many times. It's from George Box. He said, essentially all models are wrong, but some models are useful. And what I'm going to do today is I'm going to describe a class of models that we've been using. And the question we ask is not, is the model right? But rather, what we try to ask from the, the, the models we build is, what's the explanatory power of that model? What does the model show us that we couldn't know otherwise? So I'm going to start sort of tongue in cheek by telling you how not to do network analysis. And this is really a philosophy I think a lot of people have adopted. But it's one, and I hope I'll explain why, uh, that I don't think is exactly the right way to do it. So as a field, we've had access to tremendous quantities of gene expression data. And one of the things that we've gotten very comfortable with is taking those data and comparing two different phenotypes. And when we compare those phenotypes, the question we typically ask is, what genes are differentially expressed? And it's a reasonable question because what we really want to know is what processes distinguish these two different phenotypes. But as we look at that question of differential expression, we also recognize that when genes are co-expressed, they're probably, or at least possibly, interacting through some kind of network mechanism. They may be co-regulated. Uh, they may represent proteins that interact with each other um, somehow uh, in carrying out processes in the cell, and that's why the cell is expressing them at the same time. And so we assume there's some kind of interaction. And one common way to explore that is to take uh, some type of additional data besides, this gene, besides gene expression data, like protein-protein interaction data, and to merge those together. And what people have often done is taken protein-protein interaction networks and done essentially what my colleagues and I often refer to as node painting. You color the network with differentially expressed genes, and then you ask questions about how these genes or the proteins they encode are linked together. And uh, often that involves a process that uh, a former postdoc of mine, Stefan Bentick, uh, referred to as biopoetry. You take the genes and you tell a story. So uh, there's some potential problems with that. Uh, one of them is should the things that are differentially expressed actually be connected? If we have genes that are up in one situation and down in another, vice versa, should they be linked together in the network? And I'm not sure that's actually true. And then the other question is, is that protein-protein interaction network that we use even relevant? If proteins are not being expressed, they're not going to be linked together. And so if we use this data, we may draw some spurious conclusions. 
And I'm not saying that we haven't learned things from doing this kind of analysis, but I'd say there must be a better way. So there's another thing that people do um, that's similar uh, in that we start with differentially expressed genes, but once we have those, uh, what we tend to do then is to try to build network-based models. And so, oops, I'm going to have to click ahead, see if this works. So we're going to do a statistical analysis, and we're going to take our differentially expressed genes, and then we're going to use those to look for correlations in the data. So we're going to look for uh, sets of genes that are well correlated, and we'll draw those as a network. And when I draw that kind of network, there are different ways to do it. Sometimes I take all the genes that are correlated. Sometimes I may limit myself to correlations between transcription factors and their targets. But either way, to interpret this data, what people often do is to do the same kind of node painting and the same kind of storytelling. And again, I won't say we haven't learned things from doing this kind of analysis, but it's not really principled. And there are open questions which I think still have to be addressed. Number one, are things that are correlated actually functionally related? Correlation doesn't tell the whole story. And number two, are the correlations going to be the same in different phenotypes? And the fact that we look at differentially expressed genes really suggests that the correlations are going to differ between one phenotype and another. The other thing which we often worry about, at least in my group when we analyze this kind of data, is if we only focus on the differentially expressed genes, don't they work with other genes to try to create the networks and the phenotypes that we observe? So are we losing too much by doing this kind of analysis? So we've developed a philosophy um, to look at networks slightly differently. So I won't claim it's right. I think it's better in some ways. But here's what we do. We'll take our gene expression data. And then we'll use a very principled way to try to infer networks that are specific to individual phenotypes. Or uh, we'll take those networks and we'll build networks that we think reproduce individual elements of the regulatory processes that we see active in those phenotypes. We then compare the networks. And fundamentally, that's the key to the analysis we do. By comparing networks, we can ask how are they similar and how are those networks differ from each other. To do that, we look at the, the topology and the structure of the networks. We compare those topologies to find differential patterns. And instead of being individual genes, they're actually differences in the edges or the interactions in the network. And fundamentally, that's what I think we want to get at. And then we try to combine data in different ways to learn things from those differential edges or differences in topology that we observe. So that's going to be our basic philosophy. And I can tell you that over the last few years, uh, my colleagues and I have developed a whole host of different methods uh, designed to try to take advantage of these. Uh, but our starting assumptions are that, number one, there's no single right network. There's no universal network that's going to describe everything. The second, and this is probably the most important, and that is the structure of the network matters. And that network structure is going to change between states, between phenotypes. And actually, the change in that network structure, we believe, should be informative about the underlying biology. So we're moving from that question of, uh, of is the model right, instead to ask the question, is the model useful? What's the explanatory power of the model itself? So we really want to dig into this question of whether or not the network model informs our understanding of biology. So I mentioned we developed a lot of methods. We published some of these. Some of them are still under review. Uh, one of them is a method we published last summer, uh, summer of 2016. Uh, looking at bipartite community structure of expression quantitative trait loci. And I'm going to come back to that one in a little bit. Uh, a few years before, we published a gene regulatory network modeling approach we refer to as PANDA. Um, I'm not going to talk about that today uh, unless people ask questions. Uh, but uh, we've used PANDA fairly extensively to look at a wide array of different situations and compare different phenotypes and ask, how do those regulatory processes change? Um, so we have uh, R and Python implementations of Panda, as well as MATLAB implementations. And uh, you're welcome to download those and work with those.
We also developed a, a very interesting approach to inferring single sample networks. So this is something um, which I'm very excited about. Um, but again, I'm not going to talk about it in detail today. The idea is actually very simple. Uh, we call the method lioness. And if I look at all the people who are listening to this presentation today, if I collect data from all of you, I could infer a gene regulatory network for the collective body. And then if I pick one of you and set you aside, I could infer a network for the remaining individuals. And believe it or not, when I do that, those two networks are slightly different. And by comparing those two networks, by subtracting their adjacency matrices, but by comparing them, I can actually estimate the network for the individual I set out. And again, we've applied this in a variety of different situations and circumstances to learn a lot about what regulatory processes are correlated with different phenotypes. So we've published a number of different papers describing the applications of these methods. And we're very excited about the potential. If I had two hours, I'd probably tell you more stories, um, including a story about another method we developed called Monster. Then Monster was inspired in a way by my background and that of some of my colleagues in physics, where we look at two different phenotypes and represent them as two different networks and ask ourselves, if I have a healthy network and a disease network, how does the state of one transition to be the state of the other? And by looking at a transition matrix, we can actually map one network to the next. So there's a lot of things that I could talk about. But what I'm going to do is really focus on taking all of these methods, and in particular one, and applying them to what I think is one of the most interesting um, data sets available today for method development and application. And that's the GTEx data set. GTEx is the Genotype Tissue Expression Project. And in GTEx, what they did was they collected almost 600 research subjects. They're all uh, people who have died who consented to be part of this study. They've genotyped all of these individuals. They sampled 50 different sites across the body. And they profiled gene expression in those 50 different sites. So this is really a very rich data set to begin to look at and to begin to try to explore. And so what we decided to do was to take the wealth of methods we've developed and this large data set and to begin to ask questions about how we normalize data across all the different tissues, how uh, we model gene regulatory processes and compare them between tissues, uh, what the differences are between men and women in terms of expression and regulatory processes in each tissue. But the last thing I'm going to tell you about is, or the, the main thing I'm going to tell you about, is really uh, what I think is, is one of the most interesting and exciting discoveries that we made in looking at these networks uh, across multiple tissues. And that's an analysis of the role that SNPs play in determining phenotype. So I tend to frame this as the problem of solving the GWAS puzzle. So, you know, what's the GWAS puzzle? Well, the way I think of it is that genetic studies work exquisitely well if we have highly penetrant Mendelian disorders, if we find genetic variants that have a big effect size. But most of the phenotypes we look at don't have those large effect sizes. Rather, what we find are many SNPs that have very small effect sizes. So there are two studies that have been published in recent years that I think really underscore some of the challenges and opportunities here. Uh, they're both from a big consortium that refers to itself as Giant. And this is the first study, a study looking across multiple uh, GWAS studies to collect um, gene express, sorry, to collect um, genome-wide variation data, so SNP data, and to link it to a common phenotype. And in this case, the phenotype they looked at was height. So they had about 240,000 individuals. And with those 240,000 individuals, they looked for associations between different common genetic variants and height. When they did that, they found about 700 that explained 20% of height. A lot, but when you go beyond 20%, it gets even worse. To get to 21% of height, you need about 2,000 variants. To get to 24%, you need almost 4,000. To get to 29%, you need almost 10,000. Okay? That's a lot of genetic variants to explain something we all recognize 
as having a heritable component. So is this unique? Well, the answer is no. They also did another study where they looked at about 330,000 individuals and asked what are the genetic variants that are associated with BMI, body mass index. And again, what they discovered is sort of surprising. It took almost 100 SNPs, 97, to explain 2.7% of the variability we see in BMI. And they actually conclude that all common SNPs may explain 20% of body mass index. All right? So for me, that's sort of surprising. And what it points to is really the problem we have in trying to understand rare disease. So, uh, or complex disease, excuse me. So if we want to look at complex phenotypes, like complex diseases, we're going to be looking for and discovering many, many, many genetic variants that have relatively small effect size. Now, one possible explanation that's been offered as a way around this is to look at rare variants. But there have actually been conflicting studies published uh, recently that uh, either say rare variants explain none of the heritability of diabetes, or that rare variants can play a role in explaining uh, some of the, the genetic background for other diseases. So I think the jury's still out on rare variants, but even there, um, the effect sizes are likely to be rather small. And in fact, that's what we've seen so far. So how do we solve this problem? Do we give up on genome-wide association studies? Do we fine map everything and really try to look for these rare variants that may or may not be informative? Or do we think differently? And the fact that I'm giving you this presentation means I think we should probably think differently. So a few years ago, we got funding from the National Heart Lung Blood Institute to take GWAS hits that had been identified in studies of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. And we wanted to map those to function. And the problem we had was that many of the variants that we looked at uh, did not have an obvious functional association. Many fell in intergenic regions. They weren't tightly linked or associated to genes. It was difficult to think about how we test them or how we interpret them. So when we thought about this problem, we decided we were going to go back to the closest thing we could measure in large scale to phenotype, and that's gene expression. So we decided to endeavor to understand expression quantitate, lo, uh, quantitative trait locus analysis, or EQTL analysis. So what's an EQTL? Well, what we do is we take genome-wide data on genetic variants. We take SNPs. And we combine that with gene expression data. So about 15 years ago, a variety of different groups realized that they could generalize the quantitative trait locus analysis that Steve Tanksley and his colleagues developed in the 1970s to study uh, the medically important problem of tomato breeding, but where you could measure quantitative traits and associate those traits with the expression levels of uh, the, uh, associate those traits, excuse me, with the presence or absence of different genetic variants. So about 15 years ago, a number of groups recognized that each one of the 25,000 or so genes in the genome could be tweet, treated as a quantitative trait. So we measure their expression levels, we look at the genetic background in each individual, and we do a regression analysis to ask the question, which SNPs, which genetic variants, are correlated with the degree of gene expression for each one of the genes we want to study. So this has been an area where people have worked for some time. And what most people rely on when they do these studies are what we refer to as cis-acting SNPs. So if I have a gene sitting right here, if I have a SNP located immediately adjacent to that gene, that's what we refer to or call a cis-acting SNP. And what it means is that that SNP is directly adjacent to the gene. So that's one that's easy to study, it's easy to interpret. That SNP may disrupt the transcription factor binding site or some other enhancer site, and it can change the expression level of that gene. I can actually go into the lab today and use CRISPR to change uh, the promoter site to introduce that variant and to test its effect. But one of the other things that a lot of people ignore are transacting SNPs. Those genetic variants that are far away, not located in the immediate vicinity of a gene, but far away, that may actually be associated with the expression level of this gene. So we decided to do an EQTL analysis and to keep both the cis and transacting genetic variants that we found. And then 
we decided to do something a little bit different. We took those cis and transacting EQTLs and we calculated them using uh, a, a tool we really love called Matrix EQTL. Uh, but we took those SNPs, we took the genes, we calculated the EQTLs. And our hypothesis was that when we looked at them, we weren't going to see them sort of randomly associated across the genome and in, in networks. But instead, if we looked at associations, we might see not individual SNPs and individual genes, but many-to-many -many relationships that would manifest themselves in the context of an EQTL network. So we thought that they should group together functionally and that we should be able to look at that function and then, through guilt by association, begin to uh, associate genetic variants with functional consequences. So we performed a standard EQTL analysis. It's a simple regression analysis associating uh, the genotype with gene expression levels. And the trick that we played was we represented those EQTL associations, the many-to-many -many associations between one SNP and many genes, or one gene and many SNPs, as elements in what's referred to as a bipartite graph. So what's a bipartite graph? Well, it's simply a graph that has two types of elements. In the case of the, the diagram uh, I'm showing you, we have squares and circles or SNPs and genes. And in a bipartite graph, the squares are only connected to circles. The circles are only connected to squares. We don't have associations between SNPs. We don't have associations between genes. We only have associations in the model between a SNP and the genes it's correlated with or the gene and the SNP that it's correlated with. So we represent the data as a bipartite graph. And then we go back to what I started talking to you about at the beginning of this presentation. We asked the question, what does the structure of this network tell us about the underlying biology? So we really started to delve into the network and its structure. And like no, most network scientists, the first thing we did, and this was really motivated by my colleague John Platting, is we took a look at the degree distribution. So I probably should have mentioned we started this study uh, using data uh, available from a large study of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. So we had lung tissue, we had gene expression data from RNA-seq, we had genome-wide SNP profiles, and when we built this EQTL network, what we saw was that the degree distribution was exactly what we expect. All right? So in network science, we talk about the degree distribution. We plot the log of the frequency versus the log of the connectivity or the degree. And when we make that log-log plot in naturally evolving networks like the internet, telecommunications networks, what we see is that log-log plot of log of frequency versus log of connectivity has a straight line distribution. People sometimes refer to it as a scale-free distribution. It's actually formally a fat-tailed distribution. But if you look at it, what you see for both the genes in the network and the SNPs, and we plot them separately because they're vastly different numbers of genes and SNPs, but if you look at the genes and SNPs, what you see in this network is that both of them have that kind of straight line distribution. So the networks are at least what we'd expect. Now, when we look just at the SNP network, we started to ask the question we set out to answer. What do the genome-wide association discovered SNPs, the GWAS SNPs in COPD, what do they actually, what can we learn from those by looking at the network? So we took this degree distribution, and against it, what we did was we plotted those GWAS SNPs. Now, when we started, one of the things we focused on initially was the area down in the lower left-hand corner of the plot. It's what we refer to as, or I guess the lower right-hand corner, in the lower right-hand corner of the plot, it's what we refer to as the hubs, right? These are the things that are highly connected. And our expectation was that if we had genetic effects that were big, they'd probably appear in the hubs. So when we plotted the variants, and hopefully you can see them here in red, when we plotted those genetic variants that were disease-associated, what we found was that the hubs are GWAS desert. So why is that? Well, if you look at it, there are actually a couple critical ways or critical areas you can look at this um, and a couple possible explanations. 
my uh, colleague uh, Maude Fagney will tell you that um, the hubs are so rare, they're unlikely uh, to accumulate uh, disease-associated hits. But I still think maybe they could appear there by chance. And the way I understand this, um, and an explanation that I like, is based on a story. Uh, so one of my favorite stories uh, that illustrates why I think the GWAS hubs uh, are, are deserts, or the EQTL hubs are deserts, dates back to World War II. In World War II, uh, the Royal Air Force of the United Kingdom was flying missions, dropping bombs on Germany and continental Europe, and the planes were coming back shot up full of holes. Now, the Royal Air Force didn't like to see their planes being all shot up, so what they did was they engaged in a project to map where all of the bullet holes were, and then to design armor that would protect the planes where they were getting shot. So they were all geared up and ready to go into production when Abraham Wald, who was a statistician, walked in, took one look at their plans and said, stop. You want to put the armor where the bullet, where the bullet holes aren't. And the answer for why that makes sense is very simple. You see the holes that don't shoot the plane out of the sky. The holes you don't see are the ones that bring the plane down. In the same way, I think what we're looking at is in part dictated by survival bias. If we look at the hubs in the network, we actually don't expect to see genetic variants because if they're deleterious, they're very unlikely to disrupt the entire network so that whoever carries those variants doesn't survive long enough to pass them on. The truth is it's probably some combination of the two. They're rare, but if they're rare, they're going to be lethal. So if we go back to looking at this distribution now, we see one other interesting thing. That thing that we see uh, is that when we look at the leaves, the things in the upper corner of the distribution, we discover that the leaves are actually underrepresented relative to what we'd expect to see from the distribution. And then in the middle of the distribution, we see there's an overrepresentation of GWAS SNPs. So we started to ask ourselves why. Those things in the leaves are most likely um, cis-acting SNPs associated with a single gene. But you know, what about the stuff in the middle? And why do we see more than we'd expect purely by chance? So to address this question, what we decided to do was to ask whether we, we could use some of the properties of the network to understand what the SNPs are doing and to understand why they might be overrepresented. So could we look at the network and its structure to understand the functional role of these SNPs? So the idea that John Plattig and I actually developed and applied was that we should look at the underlying structure of the network itself. We should look at communities within the network. Now, what's a community? Well, you have a, a, a mobile phone. And in principle, you could call anybody in the world. But in practice, you don't. Right? You have different communities depending on the day of the week. But all of you probably have a family community. So you call your wife or husband. Your husband calls your son or daughter. Your daughter calls your son. Your son calls his grandmother. Your mother calls you. You have a family community that's defined by an increased likelihood that any two of you will call each other on any given day relative to the likelihood that somebody in your network is going to call a random person, say me. Right? So while you may one day call me, the likelihood that your mother or grandmother is ever going to call me is close to zero. Right? So you have a community that is determined by an increased likelihood that any two members in that community are connected. In the same way, we decided we could look at this bipartite representation of EQTLs, this bipartite network, and identify communities. So what we decided to do was to adapt the method that had been developed for looking at bipartite or looking for communities in bipartite graphs. And what these methods all do is optimize something referred to as the modularity. We're looking for communities that are defined by being tightly connected to each other more connected than we'd expect to see by chance. And to our surprise, what we discovered when we looked at these communities in our COPD network was that we had a number of very tight, highly connected communities, what we refer to as highly modular communities. 
the network is really organized around these tight communities. Now, if you look at this plot, what you'll see is we have a matrix. It's really the adjacency matrix with zeros and ones represented as dark colors and white. And the dark colors represent edges or connections between SNPs, which are running vertically, and genes which are running horizontally. So if you look, you can see dark stripes that run up and down, particularly to the right-hand side of this diagram. And those are the global hubs. But you also see these communities are very tight and really very well localized and isolated from other communities. There are connections, but they're not tightly connected outside. They're very tightly connected within. Now, What's interesting is when we start to look at those communities in the EQTL network, and this is just a different representation. I, I tend to refer to this as the Botticelli's Venus representation of the data. Um, they're like little seashells. When we look at these, what we see is there are 52 different communities that we found. Those communities are highly modular. They have a modularity of about 0.8, so they're really tight. Um, and of 34 that are connected together in what we call the giant connected component, 11 of those, when we look at the genes in those communities, are strongly enriched for genes which have shared function. Right? So the communities are grouping genes not in a random way, but they're grouping genes in ways that enrich for particular biological functions. And in fact, the enrichment is significant. So what we started to ask ourselves was, if we look at the COPD-associated GWAS SNPs, do these map to our networks in some way that can meaningfully tell us about what functions they might influence? So when we did that, what we found was the majority of those GWAS SNPs mapped to communities who were overrepresented or enriched for functions that made sense in the context of explaining and understanding the disease. So the network is actually organized around functionally related communities. And when we look at that network, what we see is not a single SNP regulating a single gene. But in the context of what we might expect from a complex polygenic trait, a family of genetic variants regulating a process. And in hindsight, it should have, it's exactly what we should have expected to see. And essentially, it's what our intuition told us to look for. So one of the questions people often ask is, are these communities based on their locations in the genome? This plot actually says no. What we really see is the communities are drawing both SNPs and genes from across the genome. So we then started to ask, well, if we look at these communities, just like we looked at global hubs before, could there be local hubs that tell us something about the structure of each individual community? And when we looked, we decided we had to define a metric. And this is a metric that John and I refer to as the core score. It's essentially a measure of how much of the modularity in each community is carried by an individual SNP. So it's the fractional modularity normalized by what we'd expect within a community. So what we did was we calculated core scores for all the SNPs in the network. And we asked, do these core scores in some way reflect known biology? So to address that question, we looked at 274 disease-associated SNPs from the NHIG, uh, NHGRI GWAS catalog. And what we found was that the core scores for these SNPs are far higher than one would expect by chance. Right? So these SNPs aren't randomly distributed through the network. If we look at the distribution of the core scores, the core scores for the disease-associated SNPs universally are off the charts. Okay? So what this tells us is that disease-associated genetic variants tend to concentrate at the center, at the core, of their functional communities. We then went back and asked about GWAS SNPs that had been discovered within COPD. So Michael Cho and some of his colleagues pub published a meta-analysis of GWAS data. In COPD, they identified 34 GWAS hits 
that were associated with the disease. So what we decided to do was to take those 34 hits and actually look at their core scores. When we did, what we found was that the GWAS uh, core scores were not slightly elevated. In fact, when we looked at the disease-associated SNPs in the appropriate tissue, the core scores were 20 times higher than the average core score in the network. Right? So what that really says to us is that disease-associated genetic variants sit at the cores of their community. And the reason they sit at the core of their community is that they are the ones that are most likely to perturb function. They're not at the core of the network. They're at the core of their local functional community. And the reason is that when you develop a disease, you don't develop it because the network falls apart and you die. You develop a disease because processes are disrupted. And that's exactly what this model tells us. So when we look at the model, we see that the global hubs in the network aren't GWAS hits. But instead, the networks group, SNP, group SNPs and genes together into communities. And it tells us what we should expect. A family of SNPs regulate a process or a function. The GWAS SNPs map to communities whose genes have functions that make biological sense. And in fact, they tend to be at the cores of their local communities, or at least highly connected within them. They're the ones most likely to disrupt those functions. So the individual structure of the network is informative in ways that individual SNPs or EQTL associations are not. So we actually published this in the summer of 2016. And I started by telling you we were excited about the GTEx data. So the question we asked in GTEx was, if we look across more than one tissue, and we look in individuals who don't have a particular disease, what do we find? So we wanted to look at how general what we discovered was in the COPD EQTL analysis. So I mentioned earlier that GTEx has a lot of data. Uh, there are about 600 individuals in the release we worked with that had been genotyped. We had gene expression data from 50 different sites around the body, about 9,400 expression profiles. We downloaded all of this data um, from dbGaP under an approved analysis protocol. We took those data, and after normalizing the data across all the different tissues, we ran a fairly standard EQTL analysis similar to the method that I described uh, for COPD. So we mimicked that analysis, and we began to ask how similar is what we find in all these different tissues. The first thing we found was that in the 13 different tissues for which we had enough data to do an analysis, and our threshold was about 200 samples, uh, when we looked at only those 13 tissues where we had 200 samples, what we discovered, in this case I'm showing uh, heart left ventricle, uh, what we discovered was the network was organized into the same type of highly modular communities we had seen in COPD. And in fact, we saw that in each and every one of the tissues. So the modularity ranges between about 0.7 in whole blood to a little over 0.9. And in fact, if you look at the panel uh, in purple on the right, what you'll see is that, or on the, I guess it's on the left, uh, if you look at the panel on the left, what you'll see is that um, each one of these communities, in fact, most of the communities are very highly modular. Um, so uh, we see the same basic structure we had seen when we looked at COPD. So one of the questions people have asked us is whether or not this structure is actually simply driven by co-expression. And for GTEx, we had a really interesting opportunity because we see the structure now across 13 tissues. So what we did was we looked at the correlation in gene expression within individual communities. And if you look at the plot uh, here on the right-hand side, what you'll see is the distribution of pairwise correlation coefficients in each one of the communities. And when you look carefully, what you'll see is that almost all of them for the communities are close to zero. They're centered around zero. The communities themselves, even though you might think that SNPs are gathering co-expressed genes together, or correlated genes, they're not actually linked in those communities by correlation. They're linked 
by genetic associations between the SNPs and the expression levels of individual genes. And in fact, when we look at those SNPs, no matter how we look at them, we don't see that they bring together only genes whose expression levels are highly correlated. The next thing we asked was, are the communities functionally enriched across multiple tissues? And it turns out the answer is yes. What's really interesting is we see a lot of communities that are functionally enriched for functions that are shared across many, many different tissues. But we also see tissue-specific functional communities. So if we take this model and zoom in, if you look at the little sort of snake plot uh, on, uh, on the right-hand side, what you'll see is that we have functional communities that map together to many of the different tissues that we wanted to explore and try to understand. So the communities are shared, but there are actually some communities that are unique and distinctive in individual tissues. And when I say the communities are shared, they're not shared perfectly. What I mean is that the functional associations, the groups of genes together, are largely shared, but not exactly. So we see a lot of shared functionality in core processes, but we actually see distinctive communities arise in individual tissue. So it's not quite what we would have expected, but it's actually, again, probably what we should have expected, that a lot of GWAS or a lot of EQTL associations are common, but they're actually associations that are unique, and that by looking at the networks, you can start to tease out what the differences are between them. Because the unique EQTLs don't operate in isolation, they bring other things in, other SNPs and gene in, genes in with them to form new regulatory communities. And that's essentially exactly what we found. So this is just an example for heart left ventricle community number 86. Uh, the circus plot is actually showing that what we're doing is we're bringing in SNPs and genes from all over the genome and associating them together. And then the little bubble plot is showing enrichment for different biological functions, really addressing this question of how the individual networks or the individual communities within the networks are enriched for, in this case, tissue-specific biological functions. So the networks and their structure are doing more or less what we might have expected if we think about how complex diseases and complex phenotypes work. We don't have a single variant affecting a single trait or a single gene. We have families of variants that affect families of genes. And as genes turn on and off across tissues, the associations in those families actually adjust depending on what genes are being expressed and what variants are available to begin to regulate them. So this is actually an interesting finding, and I'll come back to that in a little bit. The other thing, of course, we wanted to know was is the other lesson we learned from looking at COPD generalized to these multi-tissue networks? And the answer is yes. GWAS SNPs are cores, um, but not hubs. So we find the GWAS hits not at the center of the global network, but at the center of the local community. And in fact, in each one of the 30 or 13 tissues we looked at, the GWAS core scores are substantially higher than the core scores for all of the other SNPs in the network. So we're learning the same lesson from multiple tissues that we saw in a single tissue. And in fact, when we look at those degree distributions, what we see is time and again, uh, the, the representation of GWAS hits is overrepresented up to about degree 10 and then completely disappears at high degree. So it's those core SNPs, the things at the center of their local communities, that are associated with disease that we can identify through GWAS. GWAS SNPs perturb functions and functional communities. The other thing that was interesting uh, that we really wanted to ask ourselves was if we look at the SNPs at different locations around uh, our EQTL networks and partition them based on where those SNPs are located, are there differences in the regulatory potential? And again, 
When we asked that question, the answer was yes. In fact, what we discovered is that coarse NIPs are far more likely, based on a regulome DB analysis, those coarse NIPs are far more likely to have elevated regulatory potential relative to all of the other SNPs in the network. So the likelihood of being disease associated is tied to your core score. And your regulatory potential is tied to your core score. There's really a common theme that's starting to emerge. But I think even more interesting than this is what happens with tissue specificity. And this was something, this was a question we were only able to begin to ask once we had 13 different tissues. Because in a single tissue, what we see are all the communities in that tissue. But we don't know what's unique and distinctive about each tissue. So we looked in each one of these 13 tissues. Actually, we, uh, we ended up focusing on eight. And the reason we focused on eight was the Roadmap Epigenomics Project had mapped chromatin state uh, in only eight of the tissues that we, uh, we had profiled in this GTEx analysis. So we looked at those eight tissues. We looked at the tissue-specific communities in those EQTL networks. And we asked ourselves, of those communities, what can we learn about the SNPs and their chromatin state? And what was really interesting was when we compared the local hubs to the global hubs, we saw striking differences. When we looked in tissue-specific communities in each of these eight tissues, what we saw was enrichment for SNPs that are in tissue-specific active chromatin. And when we compared that to global hubs, what we found was the global hubs were basically enriched for non-genic enhancer elements, right? things away from the genes that enhance expression but don't regulate it. Right? So now, by combining these EQTL networks with data from the Roadmap Epigenomics Project, what emerges is an explanation for the structure that we see in the EQTL networks. That in these networks, we see tissue-specific communities. Those communities are associated with tissue-specific expression of genes, right? Those communities are carrying out functions that are unique to that tissue. And in those communities, what we see is that the SNPs at their center tend to be an active chromatin that's accessible in those specific tissues. Right? The structure of the network is influenced by tissue availability of SNPs based on chromatin structure. Those chromatin structures reorganize the network to create regulatory modules that are specific to that tissue and associated with tissue-specific epigenetic factors. So you can look at these, oops, I went backwards. You can begin to look at these in detail. And what we found were many, many examples of SNPs at the cores of their communities in these tissue-specific communities that map to regulatory areas in which there's open chromatin. So for us, this is really exciting because we move from a kind of correlative and descriptive analysis to one in which the model actually has some explanatory power. And I think even what we did in COPD has some explanatory power. But now, by looking at the chromatin state of the SNPs, we're actually able to move toward understanding mechanism. And this was something we could only have discovered by looking at these network structures. So if you're interested, I mentioned earlier um, that we had published this paper on a method called Condor. In fact, we've done an analysis of uh, these uh, EQTLs across multiple tissues. In my group, we really want to see our work available and used, so almost everything we do we post on BioArchive. Um, so in fact, there's a paper describing this uh, that's on BioArchive. And I thought I had it here. I'll show it to you in the next slide.
I'm going to tell you why I think this method isn't wrong. Uh, but first, I just want to go back and say the method we published about a year ago uh, is available. It's published in PLOS Computational Biology. We have software available that you can download and run. Uh, it's a, a, a bioconductor package called Condor. Uh, you're more than welcome to take that and run it on your own data to replicate what we've done or to, to mirror what we've done. But I want to tell you why I think this isn't wrong. And I won't claim it's right, but I really do think it has a lot of explanatory power. First, the SNPs that are global hubs are not GWAS hits. The SNPs and genes group into communities that make sense. A family of SNPs regulate a function or a process. GWAS SNPs map to functional families that make sense. The core SNPs are far more likely to be disease SNPs. And the structure of the network is informative, while individual gene SNP associations may not be. But I think the GTEx data goes beyond what we learned from our starting point. And that is that while there are many cis SNPs and cis EQTLs that are shared across multiple tissues, there are actually many EQTL communities uh, that are distinct and unique to individual tissues. So while most things, most of the cis SNPs are shared, there are some unique ones, and they're unique trans SNPs. And what those do is they organize the network differently, but in meaningful ways in each individual tissue, creating tissue-specific functional communities. When we look at these, what we see is these tissue-specific functional communities are enriched for SNPs that come from tissue-specific active chromatin. And so, irrespective of tissue, what we have is a network that's modular in which functionally enriched communities have core SNPs that are likely to be disease associated. Right? So, I think this goes a really long way to taking kind of the vagaries of analyzing um, GWAS data and the SNPs we find in a functional context. And it actually places it into a context where we can think about looking at those SNPs and understanding what they do and understanding their potential regulatory potential. Beyond that, we started to think about how we might go back and actually validate these SNPs in interesting ways. And, and one idea we had that we're looking to try to try in the future is to take SNPs at the core of the network. And rather than doing GWAS studies with all the SNPs, taking the upper quartile of core scores, and maybe the things that are at the hubs, but maybe not since they don't seem to be a GWAS associated, but to take SNPs based on their centrality in the network and to use those to do genome-wide association studies where we use function based on the EQTLs to beat down uh, some of the multiple testing problem that we worry about. So is this true? Well. I turn back to one of my idols, Stephen Colbert, and the word from his uh, program on Comedy Central. And uh, in his very first show, he used a phrase I really like, truthiness. When you feel it in your gut, you know it must be right. And while I can't prove every individual association, we can't get down to the level of the weeds. But in fact, when we look at that mid-level structure, that structure is more informative about the way in which SNPs operate to influence phenotype than virtually any other model I've looked at. It feels right in a lot of ways. So I hope you find this kind of truthy. Uh, if you're interested in more, I mentioned we published a number of papers doing analysis of GTEx. That includes a pipeline for doing multi-tissue, sparse-aware gene expression uh, normalization. Uh, a paper that describes our analysis of these EQTLs. Uh, another paper that looks at the difference between cell lines and uh, the primary tissues from which they were derived. A fourth paper that looks at sexual dimorphism across, I think, 32 tissues. Uh, another paper that looks at gene regulatory networks and um, gene expression in tissue-specific manner. And then another paper that I'm very excited about that I would have loved to talk to today if I had more time, uh, some work really led by Joe Barry uh, to look at individual imaging phenotypes 
from histological slides that GTEx had uh, made available to look at parameters in those images and to associate them with genetic variants. As an example, we did this in thyroid, and we looked at Hashimoto's syndrome, uh, a disease associated with invasion of lymphocytes and hypothyroidism. So when we look at the imaging features, what we actually find are genetic variants that are associated with those imaging features and predictive of disease. So I invite you to take a look. Um, to make it easy, we actually put together some GTEx EQTLs. Um, so they're all tiny URLs, and they're GTEx0 to GTEx6. But if you just go to BioArchive um, and search for my last name, Quackenbush, uh, you'll find all of these papers. So I open with a quote. I'm actually going to close with two. Uh, these are quotes I really like. The first is from the science fiction author, uh, William Gibson. The future is here. It's just not widely distributed yet. So hopefully now through this conference, it's distributed through 10,000 or more people. Um, and uh, my, one of my favorite quotes from Enrico Fermi, I'm a physicist by training. Uh, Fermi was a physicist, of course. And uh, one of the quotes from uh, Fermi that I really like is, before I came here, I was confused about this subject. After listening to your lecture, I am still confused, but at a higher level. Uh, so the last thing I, I want to do is just close by um, uh, recognizing uh, the really talented group of people I worked with. Uh, at Dana-Farber, uh, I have a group of postdocs and students, uh, Joe Barry, Joey Chen, Sheila Gaynor, Mariki Kujer, uh, Camilla Lopez-Ramos, Mega Patty, Joe Paulson, uh, John Pladdock, and Dan Schlock. Uh, we worked very closely with uh, a colleague and former postdoc at Brigham and Women's, Kimberly Glass, uh, another faculty colleague there, Don DeMeo, um, and uh, one of Kimby's postdocs, uh, Abby Sonawi. And uh, last but not least, Nicole Trotman has been uh, a great support for us. And we have funding from a lot of organizations. So I, I've been seeing questions pop up. I have a few more minutes, so I'm going to lean forward, uh, bring up the questions, and uh, just see if I can answer some of these uh, before, well, before we get too lost. So let's see if I can get them up. OK, oh, wrong one. Um, nothing is ever as easy as it looks. There we go. All right. Um, so uh, I'm going to have time for a few questions. But uh, uh, the first, uh, you mentioned tissue specificity. How many of the genes are tissue specific? Uh, so that's actually a very good question. And I mentioned we, uh, we have a paper in the BioArchive that's under review now looking at what we mean by tissue specificity. Um, it was very interesting. When we started doing normalization, we discovered that there was really only a small core of genes, but that a lot of genes appeared to be specific to individual tissues. When we actually dove into this and began to look carefully, what we discovered was that tissue specificity in many ways was a misnomer that while we tend to think of tissue-specific uh, genes, they're really more tissue-limited in their range, that um, they're usually small numbers of tissues that will express each tissue-specific gene, not the entire repertoire, but a small number. Um, and so we see a limited range in tissue expression, not specificity. On the other hand, when we look at these EQTL networks, what we find is that there are uh, range-limited genes that are expressed, and that those map to communities with functions that really help us understand uh, the, the function of the tissue or, or what the tissue is doing. And when we look at the, the SNPs, as I mentioned earlier, those SNPs are in regions that have been active, annotated as being active chromatin in individual tissues. So we're not yet sure about how that limited range tissue expression correlates exactly with um, open chromatin. But it's one of the questions we really want to try to explore. And again, I, I really want to compliment the people uh, responsible for GTEx, because it's given us an amazing playground uh, to begin to ask fundamental questions about gene regulation and the processes associated with it. Um, so um, here's another question. You started by uh, talking about the GWAS problem. How would this solve that problem? Well, uh, I think it does two things. First, 
what this analysis allows us to do is to go back in and to look at SNPs that have been identified through GWAS and map them to functions or functional groups. The other thing it allows us to do, though, and I alluded to this earlier, is it gives us the opportunity to look at SNPs and based on predictions we make from the network models, map them forward to GWAS studies. So we could take all the SNPs, rank them by core score, take the upper quartile, and rerun GWAS. One of the things we'd love to do, maybe before going down that road, is actually to look at independent studies where we have this kind of data to really understand how, repli uh, how replicable these networks and their communities are across multiple tissues. That's been hard to do. I didn't get a chance to tell you uh, about some analysis um, today that we're working on, uh, but we've been applying these methods to look at chronic obstructive pulmonary disease and other data sets. The first one I told you about was in lung tissue. We actually have data from two independent studies in blood. And as we've been looking at whole blood and GWAS and whole blood, or EQTL analysis in whole blood in COPD, what we're seeing is that just like when we compared multiple communities across tissues, when we look across studies, there's a great deal of homogeneity in terms of the functions that are represented and the structure of the overall networks. So they don't replicate perfectly, but they actually tell a very coherent story. And I think at the end of the day, that explanatory power is um, one of the, the, the most interesting questions we have to address. So, um, sorry, my calendar just came up telling me I'm almost done. Uh, so, uh, another question. Um, how significant are changes in the EQTL network topology? And I decided to ask that, or answer that one because this is similar to, um, uh, it's related to the question I just discussed, right? How we compare communities between networks. And this is actually a really interesting open statistical problem. Um, there are lots of methods that have been developed to look at communities um, between networks. Some of them just look at differences between the networks and then compare back and forth. Uh, some of them compare two communities to a background of random networks. Uh, we've actually been developing methods, and this is really work that Mega patty has been doing, uh, looking at comparisons of one network in the context of the background of another network. Uh, but how precisely to do that has been a challenge. Mega's actually developed an idea around message passing that looks to be statistically sound and robust. But I will say that this is still an open question. So I tend to speak of it a little bit qualitatively. We have lots of <coughs> metrics that tell us the communities are very similar in terms of shared SNPs, uh, shared genes, shared structures. But uh, I can't actually give you a p-value yet because, as I said, that's still an open question in network biology. Um, so um, someone asked, are the software and data available? Um, if you go and look at any of the papers in BioArchive, there are links in each paper to the underlying software. My group and I are really committed to reproducible research. So every paper we publish has software and has the, uh, at least an associated vignette so you can run the analysis and try to reproduce it. So we really try to describe what we do. Um, the caveat, of course, is that the EQTL data, the, the GWAS data, is protected data. That's available, though, through dbGaP. The process of applying for access to that data is easy. Um, and if you download both the data and the gene expression data, what you'll discover is that you have to normalize the data. Um, we have a paper on a method we call YARN for doing that normalization um, that uh, will tell you how to reproduce that kind of multi-tissue normalization. I will caution you that if you want to re uh, reproduce or replicate the EQTL analysis, the data, the gene expression data that's available on the GTEx portal is slightly different than the data that's available uh, uh, from dbGaP. So just recognize that if you want to mix and match data, you probably want to be careful. Um, when we started this analysis, we went back to dbGaP to have access to all the primary data. Um, so uh, there's another question that's kind of related to that. Uh, uh, how similar are, the, are our analysis uh, 
uh, how similar is our analysis to the analysis from GTEx? Uh, when we look at the EQTLs, as I uh, mentioned earlier, a lot of the SIS uh, SNPs are shared. It's about 80%. Uh, so there are some differences that we see between our SNP calls and their SNP calls. Uh, we can compare our trans calls to theirs because they didn't publish any. But the SIS calls are highly, um, uh, highly correlated. And um, I can't comment on the network structure because, uh, as I uh, mentioned earlier, we don't have um, those uh, SIS SNPs. Uh, we don't have, uh, GTEx doesn't have trans SNPs. Uh, I wanted to show you a website we're, we've put up that has the SIS SNP calls. Uh, unfortunately, it's still on a, um, uh, a pilot server. It's not on a production server yet. So I can't give you the URL. Uh, but if you come back and look for our paper, uh, which we hope will be published soon, uh, there'll be a link to that. Uh, and we may try to push it out through, um, uh, through the paper and bio archive. I probably only have time for one or two more questions. Um, one quick question. You only do 13 tissues. GTEx has data on almost 50 sites. Why didn't you do more? Uh, the answer to that question is simple. Uh, we only looked at tissues where we had more than 200 samples. So uh, we did the analysis for more, but we really wanted to publish in tissues where we had a high degree of confidence. So those are the 13 you saw. And um, the uh, other question, did you have to do anything special with the data to do the EQT analysis across tissue? Uh, across multiple tissues. Again, uh, what we really did was built uh, what I think is a pretty robust quality control pipeline. Uh, and uh, one of the things we did was that multi-tissue normalization from the RNA-seq data. Uh, one of the things I'm looking into right now is whether we can deposit that normalized RNA-seq data back into um, uh, uh, either dbGaP or hopefully, since it's normalized, we just have count data into geo. Uh, one of the other things uh, we're very interested in doing is making uh, the networks that we've developed available. Uh, it turns out there's no repository today that will accept those, uh, but uh, we're looking into different options to try to do that. So uh, I think I've more than exhausted my time, uh, but I, I want to thank you for spending uh, time with me today, uh, for <laughs> sitting and listening through me talk about uh, some of the work we've done. I hope you're as excited about it as we are. And uh, I'm sorry I didn't get to answer everyone's questions. Uh, but um, if you look at the very last slide, um, if it's still up, I have to go back. There we go. It's still there. If you look at the very last slide, in the upper right-hand corner uh, is my email address. My name is John Quackenbush. If you Google me, I'm pretty easy to find. Uh, but if you have open questions and want to drop me a note, I'm more than happy to answer them. Uh, so again, thank you very much. Um, thank you to the LabRoots people for organizing what I think is really an exciting conference. And um, I'm looking forward to the next couple days. Um, and uh, I'm just very grateful to be a part of it. So thank you. And uh, enjoy the rest of the conference and the rest of your day. <laughs>